Um, so uh, this is the new venture accelerated pitch. It's the first time we're having a pitch in person, pitch event in person since 2019. And so it's been three years since uh, an accelerated pitch event in person. So thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. For all the founders, you're going to be coming up in this direction, even though I had mentioned previously that direction. You can see it's blocked off. There's cables in the front. Just be aware of that so you don't uh, trip or do anything like that. So I wanted to thank the judges uh, here. So you took the time to come today. We have uh, two new people and then four judges who have been with us almost from the beginning. Uh, Aaron, who's the founder of Regulit Regalytics. Regalytics. Regalytics, founder of Regalytics. <laughs> the other Aaron, who's the founder of Sidene. Uh, Anthony, the founder of Rare Cuts. Uh, Brian, you just, your company was acquired, right? We were acquired last year, yeah. You were acquired last year, now yep. you're the head of product yep. for Recruiter.com, yep. right? Philip, uh, Masha Media founder, and then Ryan, you're the digital chief digital officer at People First. Yes. So thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate it. You can see the beautiful faces. Then I wanted to thank my team. Uh, we have three great interns. Uh, Yufei, who's going to be doing the timing today. Hey, Yufei. Um, Mohammed, who's been helping out with the live stream and he does a lot about TikToks. If you ever seen any of his TikTok videos, they're hysterical. Uh, Marwa, who's actually an intern with us, but she's part of this uh, cohort, so she's not helping out in that way, but she's helping out with her energy as always. Uh, myself, Remy Artiaga, I'm the executive director, and then fabulous Adia Johnson, who's just been a godsend to us. She joined us in July, so thank you. So we have two accelerators. We have New Venture Accelerator 1 and New Venture Accelerator 2. New Venture Accelerator 1 takes you from a blank sheet to a prototype, a learning prototype, something that you can take out to customers. So that's what this event is for today. This is the cohort, all students. Then we have New Venture Accelerator 2, and that's from a prototype to pre-launch. Some launch, but it always takes about, we found around three years before they really begin to get market traction. Around three years out from the program, which a number of the ones that were there in 2019, 2020, they're doing some nice things now. So um, we couldn't do the program without the mentors. We have a really interesting model where we have mentor teams, mentor startup teams, and they come together as teams. Uh, they're great people. Our two senior mentors, executive mentors, is Gail Yankosek and Jeanette Lasoda. Uh, so they kind of speed, they're the point guards of the team, so to speak. And then we have a team of other mentors that so you can see here in these two sheets. And they've been tremendous. I mean, the amount of time that the mentors give uh, week in and week out, when they commit to doing it for that semester, they commit, you know, hard. You know, like Elon Musk would say, hardcore, right? <laughs> so they say they're hardcore. Um, our reach is, uh, is throughout the whole CUNY system. City University of New York, 275,000 students, uh, 25 colleges. And then uh, here's some of the demos for those 275,000 students. 45% uh, are first generation students. And also 42% live in households that make less than $20,000 per year. So a lot of our students are working full time, they're going to school, and then they're taking time to do this extracurricular activity which is tremendous. Uh, partners, so we're located right now in the Field Center for Entrepreneurship, um, and that's part of the Sigmund School of Business, which is part of Baruch College. And so we're part of that family. And then MUFG, who supported us over the years now, uh, many years running. Okay, our agenda, we're gonna have five teams present. Each team is gonna get five minutes to present and followed by five minute Q&A. And then there'll be a little bit change of maybe a minute or so while one team gets set up and the other team moves out. Then the scores are gonna get tabulated. They get done automatically at our artificial intelligence <laughs> unit over here, right? And then we get the third place, second place, and first place. Third place will get $750. Second place will get $1,250, and first place gets $3,000. So I know all the students did this because they wanted to do it, but we wanted to give a little something. In the beginning, I told them there were no prizes, um, but it, it was nice to be able to do that. Cool. All right, so the first team up is going to be Quick Break.
quick break? When you hear your name, just come on down. Good morning, judges. How are you? Good morning. Great. So I have a little presentation. I have a little prototype that I've made up for everyone. So please go. Thank you. Here's a brick. Here's our brick. And y'all will have to share. Sure. Here's a brick. And here's a brick. Thank you. You're welcome. Very excited. Very excited. Very excited, everyone. <laughs> so, Jonathan, take it away. All right. Good morning. We are Quick Brick. The mission of Quick Brick is to become a leading sustainable plastic manufacturer. We want to rebuild the United States with one brick at a time, and the overall size market is $731 billion with a growth rate of 4%. So we have found that the construction industry is generating a lot of waste during new builds and demolition, and it takes about three months to build. 40% of the construction waste could be recycled, but isn't it being addressed and it's creating a global problem and it's only being addressed in the United States by percent of the recycling. All right, uh, thank you Jonathan. To address this uh, plastic waste problem, we are trying to convert the plastic waste into the red brick in your hand. Quick brick, it's durable, weatherproof, bulletproof, and uh, fireproof. With this interlock feature, we can build a house just uh, in four days. So very, very uh, efficient. Uh, next slide, please. The market for uh, this product is uh, huge. And uh, the total market in this global is about more than $700 billion. And uh, we can address the market is uh, uh, more than $200 billion in USA, the construction material sustainable, right? And uh, in New York City, we are targeting the top five to top 10% income family with uh, the income uh, about uh, $250,000 income who buy about 1,200 new homes in this city, the market size is about half billion dollars. So this is not small for us, enough for profit. Next slide, please. In this market, the competitor not only includes the traditional billion dollar player like uh, the brick player, uh, Aris Craft, and the wood company, uh, that's a freezer. There are also some other small players like us, startup, who are also trying to develop plastic bricks. But compared to their product, our product combines all of the uh, advantages, sustainable insulation, uh, dur uh, durability, and uh, fireproof, bulletproof. So our product is very, very competitive in this city with increasing crime rate, a lot of uh, Shooting now. Uh, thank you, Sunshine. Uh, based on our attractions, uh, on phase one, we already have a prototype, which is in your hand, and a team form. And phase two, we already have a website built, which is really exciting. And phase three, which we already accomplished, thanks to our founder, Jessica, we got a loan, a business loan approved. Our next uh, phase will be around phase three and four, where we have to license manufacturing with uh, other partners and uh, agreements with uh, other companies. So, of course, uh, we we're going to be allocating $10,000 with strategic partners such as Home Depot's Lowe's, and Ace. These are usually out hardware outlets. Uh, we will also be allocating 10 k for social media such as Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, YouTube for social media advertisement, and $200 to clean up the website. And for strategic partners, we will be sharing, sharing profit uh, the website and uh, outlets, hardware outlets. So based on the business model, um, this is just an example, 5,000 contractors coming from these hardware. Uh, we'll be selling the bricks for low end of $7 to 12, a high end of 12, and a premium at $10. And our annual with the four expenses will be around $80 million. Um, thank you, Jeff. I mean, thank you, Adam. <laughs> My name is Jessica. So the boring part is the projected revenue. Our revenues, we are, um, our first year we're experiencing maybe four million. Our cost of goods are pretty um, um, high because of we went on to the low end because we didn't have a exact um, thing. So we make, made our cost of goods on the high end. And our net profit at, um, before expenses will be three million. 
So our revenue growth year over year will be 41%. Our EBT, EBITDA, sorry, growth, it will be 60% with profit margins between 75 to 85%. Um, and average customer growth will be 30 to 35%, which we will, um, those are um, cost to acquire. So we are asking for $750 million, I mean, $750,000, <laughs> excuse me. And this is for the research and development um, part of our um, um, our brick with promotional campaigns, which will be included with marketing and and a new hires for the next two years. Um, next slide. And this is our team, which was Jonathan, Sanji, myself, and Adam. And thank you. And I hope you got uh, um, enjoyed our presentation. I will be opening up our Q and A's for judges. If you have any questions, any questions, ask away. Please. Uh, yes, uh, a few questions. Uh, great presentation. Um, <clears throat> has anything been built using Quick Brick to this point? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, we have um, with our products or just similar products on the market? With your guys' products. With our products, no, we haven't mm -hmm. actually gotten to that point. Um, we've just been uh, 3D printing models and they've cool. been taking long to a long time. Mm -hmm. So like each brick that you see and they have in hand took a 10 and a half hours to make. Okay. So okay. it's like um, doing through a 3D printer is kind of small and it's not really feasible for us to really do anything. Cool. And, and then, I'm oh, sorry, one more question too to follow up. Uh, so you said these cost between seven to twelve dollars a brick. What's no, no, no. They we're selling them from seven to twelve. Seven 12 to twelve. Dollars. Okay. The so cost to make them is going to be at the high end of four four dollars and fifty cents. Perfect. Okay. As compared to a standard brick that you find at Home Depot, what's that? What's the going rate for that? The going rate for that would be four dollars a brick, but they're they're honestly not cost effective. Gotcha. Yeah. How do you solve the three D printer problem? That that's that's a long time. Make one piece. Um, we are basically going to do a, a mold. Um, when we basically extrude and shred our products and mix them together with a trade secret recipe, they're going to go into a mold because the mold's going to be producing at a faster rate of speed because it takes uh, less time to cool down, about two hours to cool down, and honestly, we can make 500 bricks within an hour. That's like a pallet of bricks. How does that compare to traditional brick? Um, traditional brick, um, it basically gets kilned in the fire. And when it's get killed, it takes about seven days to cure. So it def definitely takes longer process. And yes, it's been um, done for thousands of years. And the industry's mindset is what's not broke, don't fix. So it's a lot of room for innovation. And I suggest that that, that analysis you just gave us is a, a major selling point. Because I, I had no idea. I do, I'm in the construction business. I buy a brick, that's fine. But it takes a week for it to cure. Yes. You're way ahead. If you can, if you can get your product working that way, it saves a lot of money and time. Yes, we. we but we, that's not in your presentation. Oh, no, I apologize. No, no, it no, takes, no apology. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I think that uh, that would. We had been we had a uh, striking. We were supposed to get like limited things, uh, but from what I found out, it takes like 30 percent less to cost to manufacture for the bricks to make. So it's 30 percent. Ryan, did you have a question? I saw you raising. Yeah. Hand. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Anything here you could patent? Yes, they were actually patent pending. Okay. So um, that's not in the slides either. So we are, um, it, it, it's only $75 to patent pending, and we um, did that pretty much last week. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, okay. Aaron? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't quite clear to me, so you guys talked about sort of waste and recycling the waste, but it wasn't clear how you're actually going to get or gather that or utilize it. Oh, we, okay, so we, uh, how we figured to gather is we are going to, um, basically hire people who are unhirables and from those unhirables they will go out and collect HDPE plastic and tire rubber and then we will um, and then we can pay those employees in cash like as um, independent contractors mm -hmm. and that's how we can acquire waste at a low cost. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, two. First is it, for where you are how do you plan to achieve it was was it four million in revenue in 2023 mm -hmm. in your forecast? Yeah. So how do you get up and running, operating? We, and we were actually going to license, or Adam mentioned, we were going to license out of the formula because that will basically be the shortest to market and the shortest to like uh, produce the product if we license out to the manufacturers and distributors. So we presume that by 2023, the end of 2023, we will have it distributed and making money by then. Okay. 
Okay. And second question is from the market slide that you had. Mm -hmm. Are you targeting contractors who would normally use plastic recycled materials, or are you targeting people who would also use bricks? Because I think you had looked at the TAM as being just people who are using recycled plastic materials for construction. Yeah, sure. So for your total addressable market, I think on the slide it was showing that you're going after contractors or companies that are using um, recycled plastic building materials. Is that the only market that you're after? Or are you trying to replace traditional bricks with recycled plastic bricks? Uh, we're pretty much trying to replace the tra traditional bricks that, that's outside, which can deteriorate quicker than what we have. Again, uh, we, we've emphasized that it is more sustainable, um, more durable, and bulletproof, especially the, the crimes at New York. And just to also to say that they doesn't biodegrade within 200 years, and they're weatherproof. So when most bricks aren't weatherproof, most people don't know that. Um, they're very they they probably you have to replace them every 50 years. Yeah, those oh, selling points okay. all make sense, but for the TAM, the end of the I would do all the building materials. Okay. End of Q and A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hang jobs? Where's hang jobs? Oh, there you are. So that was pretty nice. Started off with a prototype in hand. I wasn't uh, aware that was going to happen. So it's always a pleasant surprise. You can touch something and see something, yeah. If you think about that this whole team came together on day one, didn't know each other, no ideas, solidified, anything like that, in 10 weeks. Uh, Jordan? <laughs> Can anyone in the room tell me what name in investing is like hearing Voldemort's name from Harry Potter? Anyone? Anyone? The word is uncertainty. Here at Hang Jobs, where we do the hanging so you can spend more time hanging, we'll address, we'll address any uncertainties you may have about, our, about our, our business in our investor pitch deck. Our business is straightforward. We're building a, a mobile coat check service for patrons visiting small to mid-sized uh, small to mid-sized bars like the one you see in this image. Overview. The service, and industry, the service industry is not new to taking brick and mortar businesses and converting them into mobile businesses. For example, uh, this luxury mobile shop, bar, mobile barbershop, they take clients on the street or they go to people's houses and cut their hair. And it's not even new to the nightlife industry in which we operate. Speaking of Daniel's Chicken and Party Bus, they ride around playing beautiful um, Caribbean and Spanish music and having people dance and drink liquor. Now for the problem slide, Nancy will present it. Hey everyone, bar patrons are having a dilemma when heading out to bars that don't offer coat check. They can either hang on to their belongings all night or hide it precariously and quite honestly, pretty obviously, as you can see from this picture taken here at an actual bar in Williamsburg. This leaves their coats to be lost, damaged, or stolen and themselves irritated. Coat sales are expected to grow to 134 million pieces in the next three years. Next slide. And a study down in the Midwest shows that people want to throw off their jackets. When asked if they would be more likely to bring a jacket out if coat check was offered, the likelihood doubled. This proves that bar patrons would love to be worn on their trips to and from a night out as long as they could have safety for their beloved belonging. Next slide. What's the solution? Hangjobs is looking to take the coat check out of the bar with a mobile coat check truck. This allows ease of use and accessibility for bar patrons, while also freeing up space for revenue generating activities for the bar itself. Think an extra booth, an extra bar, a coat check attendant <coughs> turned server, Next slide. Looking at the market, we're addressing uh, U.S. bars overall and uh, the entire country. That brings in about 71,600. Drilling down a little bit more to the adjustable market, we're looking at New York State, 
that brings it down to about 6,500. And our target market, which is going to be the five boroughs, specific, more specifically um, Brooklyn and Queens, is about 2,100. Looking at the overall growth rate, that's about 6.1% 6, 6, 6 from 2021 to 2022. Here's our competition side where we compare, our, where we compare other companies that offer similar experience that we serve. Looking at Checkology and Capital Code Check, they offer a code check service for customers around their area, but they do not provide the code truck, but they do not provide the code check truck. Additionally, Capital Code Check does not provide private events or private event service, nor ticketless code check. Human behaviors, as what Nancy said earlier, such as leaving jackets on their waist or hiding jackets at the side of the bar, is another example of our competitors as customers already used to do. And now, Nancy will happen to discuss about the traffic. Here's a timeline of Hangjob's progress over this 10 week course. In the last Two weeks, we've closed the deal with Sister Bars, The Breakers, and The Woods in Williamsburg. They were impressed by our mobile model and, coincidentally, just ended their contract with our competitor, Checkology. We plan to start the first weekend after Thanksgiving or once the temperature drops below 40 degrees, whichever comes first. Next slide. Hang jobs will be a direct-to-consumer model, with the bar patrons being our customer. At $4 a coat and an estimated 10,000 coats checked a season, which is four months in New York, we're looking at $40,000 in revenue. Taking out 38% for expenses, including truck rental and labor, we're looking at a 24,800 profit margin per truck. Next slide. The marketing cost will be net zero because we're planning to create buzz with social media and organic advertising using the truck itself. Since the truck will be parked right outside of the venue we're serving, it will also serve as a conversation piece and a billboard of sorts, directed right at the target audience. Next slide. Everyone's favorite slide, the financial slide. Looking at income and expenses, we see that in the first year, we're looking to bring in about 40,000 with 15,000 expenses. If you follow this formula, every year we add another truck, that doubles our, our expenses, that doubles our, our, our revenue. So that would bring us to 80,000 in the second year, 30,000 in the in the second year for expenses as well, bringing to a, bringing us to a, a growth rate of 100%. Looking at the growth, gross margin, we're coming at about 63%, and our operating margin is about 38%. So what are we asking for? We're asking for 10 to 15k for an Enco's trailer. Think about the trailers that they put horses in, and we're looking at a three-month reservation where we convert the truck from a coach, from an enclosed, enclosed trailer into a coach check truck adding things like shelves and coat racks. Some milestones we'll be able to hit with your investment is servicing bars in the Williamsburg neighborhood, uh, building trust with the brand because it will consistently be there with a consistent brand and cons consistent process. And that 3,000 in maintenance will allow us to do to prep for the prep the car and do private events in the off season. Let's think banquets, uh, holiday parties, things like that. Now we would like to mention our team members. Well, we have Hunter, he's the Chief Financial Officer, has five plus years of data and analytic experience, and four plus years of working in the nightlife industry, fulfilled a variety of roles at nightlife venues. Then we have Nancy, who's on FaceTime with us. Uh, she has six years experience in uh, medical device sales, two years of experience in Bruce MBA program. And there's me, who's on the I'm the Chief Technology Officer, I'm a first year student at Brew College, uh, two years of technical ex experience, and I'm hoping to become a computer scientist. No. Thank you. Now Nancy will close us out with uh, the closing statements. Thank you, judges. Thank you, classmates. We are incredibly grateful for this experience. Some say strangers often end up friends, but through MBA One, not only did strangers end up as friends, we've ended up as co-founders. Thank you for your time, and now we're open for questions. Guys, have any questions? We'd love to take them. Why is your ask so small? Why only one truck? Uh, <laughs> we're uh, so when you take on more trucks, that means more employees, which would mean compensation insurance, more liability insurance. As a small startup at the moment, we would like to scale at a reasonable rate. So we're going to be working the trucks ourselves, which will take off the cost of compensation uh, insurance, 
liability insurance will be will still be uh, a thing, but it won't be as large if we if we have more trucks. How do you support the three of you guys on one truck? How do we support that? When you talk about the the profit margins, I, I think you guys want to eat, right? Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem there's enough revenue or profit left to pay for three people, even in one truck. In the, in the first year, we're not really looking to take a, any, any profit. We're looking to, to take any money that's made and reinvest it into getting an actual truck if we don't get your uh, gracious investment. With the jackets themselves, um, do we, uh, say we check in with you guys, uh, do we go to the truck after, or do you have like an upcharge where someone could deliver the code to the person in the bar? That's a great question. So as, as we extend our product line, we will have services like delivery, um, maybe a drop-off box, things like that to, you know, just in case people forget it, they can come back and get it, you know, things like that. Right. Yeah, I guess that was my question. And so, also, ahead, Sorry, then. also to add on to this point, that is something that we have planned for growth in the future, a convenience model. So we are looking to develop an app in the future where you can text for your jacket to be ready, such as what you often do when you're valeting a car. You text for that car to be ready at a certain time. Included in that package might also be an Uber call link to our app, and that, that is coming down the pipeline. Additionally, we were also thinking about, <clears throat> we're also planning on making a website that also offers a similar experience as what the app would serve. Is it one truck per venue, or is, uh, is it one truck per multiple in a similar location? That's a great question as well. So that's the that's the, the major difference between traditional and a mobile co check, right? In the traditional business, you're limited to just that location. The fact that we are outside, we can park, we can pull up to a very busy block, communicate to every owner that we're offering the service, and then open up for business and potentially reach three uh, three bars on one block, or and so on and so on. The yeah. idea with the app is to create like an Uber system where you could open up the app and from wherever you are, find the closest uh, hang job truck. So you Brian had a question next. Yeah, what do you do about trust? Can you be more specific? Yeah, you have someone handing their coat to somebody in a truck. They could drive away. So that was that was one of the assumptions that we made, that mm -hmm. people would have, would have to learn to trust us with uh, their, their coat. Um, we do, we will display our liability insurance, just like any other a business like Uber. If their uh, an event was to happen where an accident happened, they would be covered. So we would definitely let them know that, first of all, a disclaimer, we're not responsible for anything goes you know, missing, but if there's an egregious situation, we do have liability insurance to cover your expenses. Sir? So. And also, adding to Hunter's point as well, um, the trust, that's a great point, but you think about some of these legendary startups that happen, such as Uber and Airbnb, they really change the paradigm to make people comfortable with getting strangers' cars, staying in strangers' houses, right? So we're looking at the future, and it has to be just uncomfortable enough to change the paradigm going forward. And uh, one more question. Uh, are you planning to have the customer come outside the venue in the cold and get their truck from the car, I mean, get their coat from the truck? Or will you guys bring it inside so, so they're still warm? Similar question to what Anthony had asked. Oh. We're, we're moving uh, slowly but surely down the product line, and that is one of the features to allow for when you open up the app, we can send you, say we know the bar closes at four o'clock, we can send you a message 15 minutes in advance, letting you know that we're, we're gonna be closing up soon, you might wanna come get your coat. Let's say they're, they're not in a condition or position to do so. They can respond and say, could you deliver it? And then there's an upcharge fee for that. So like once again, it's a slow but sure process, but we, we have thought about that. How, how many people can be on, how many workers can be on the truck at the same time? Ideally two. So one person one person checking in items and one person hanging up the items. Um, but, you know, if we can get a larger truck down the line, we can open up two windows where we have one person checking in, one person checking out, and one person actually stacking up. How do you hire when you scale? You, let's assume you're very successful. Now you need more people. This will be the last out. question. Okay. Doing other things, how do you find people and keep yourself staffed? Uh, that's another great question. I mean, we would start from hiring within. Uh, building those relationships with the bar attendants, building those relationships with the with the busters, and asking them first and foremost, who do they think would be a great a great uh, person and asset to this team? Because they understand the industry better than anyone, because they're there on a daily basis, so they can send us the best people. Excellent. Thank you. Good job.
Good morning, everyone. Today we present Easy Meat. Your no hassle social life. We set the plan, so you, you do, do it. it. <laughs> Easy Meats, our platform lets you plan for you or your friends to save money and time. Speaking of overview, the planning event and social network industry is worth $44 billion and has a growth rate by 47%. So it's already in high demand. How we look to tap into that industry is by taking your safe social media posts and turning them into automatic and personalized itineraries for you and your friends. Planning and outing is already in struggle because it is time consuming, different um, schedule, different conflict schedule, and different budgets and interests. Our survey shows a total of 79% of our target market do struggle making joint plans. So now, looking at our survey, here's what our target market is saying. As you can see, people do indeed struggle with making plans. They struggle to find places, and they're also struggle with money and but they're also looking for places to go to have fun that's on social media and lucky for them we're trying to address those problems when it comes to problem size 131 million dollars is lost annually for CUNY students because manual planning is time consuming so people my age take about three hours to plan for an event they have to message their friend and then maybe check um, if uh, check if their calendar is aligned and uh, maybe social media to, for places to go but we don't want that because that's way too slow our solution is to create EasyMeets, a platform that generates planning in no time. It will save you money, save you time, and synchronize interest. Our prototype shows that. So this is a new user. As soon as they log in, there's their profile, there's their friends list over there. They can also check their calendar to see when they are free. They can also have a friend to request them to hang out, and they can reject or accept it. There's also a chat feature. In that chat, they can see their profile, request a day to go out, and then fill in the information, and a plan is set ready for them. They can rearrange or approve the plan. This is for a solo person, same information. This is the home page where people, other users can share what they do. This is for only one um, event, or this is a full plan that they can save. This is also the user can share their own experience. Market size. So we're first going to start off with our target market, which is CUNY students. And then next we're looking to expand to all social media users within the New York area. And then finally, we're also looking to expand towards 300 million social media users within the entire United States. So what do we do best? Most of our competitors have one or two features, like making planning more efficiently or recommending places to go. But we do all of that and more. We can even create personalized plans, allow budget preferences, and sync calendars. Traction. So what have we done so far? Well, we've created our team, we've sent out our survey, we've complete, we've designed our prototype, and now we've completed our pitch deck. And of course, in the present time, we're now looking to create easy needs. So our business model is a freemium business model. It is free to use locally. Where subscription is going to be only $36 annually, and that is to use outside of your local space. Our projected revenue is $100. At 3.6 million as we hit the first 100,000 users, our gross profit is going to be estimated to be 2.6 million. Our go-to market for awareness, we're going to be heavily focused on influencers through our social media, word of mouth and college events, and the press release to speak about the app. Our evaluation is going to be free to download and free to use locally. Our purchase is going to be in-app for premium functionalities. When it comes to financials, we have mainly two revenue streams. One is ads and the second is subscriptions. And within five, and also we have an estimated growth rate of 120%. Now, why do we justify such a high growth rate? Well, because all of our features are already in high demand. All we do is to just group them all into one app. So within five years, we'll have a total revenue of $7.4 million and a total ops of 860 and a total cogs of uh, $2 million. And what that shows is a low cost of operations. And also, if you look here, our gross profit and EBITDA is estimated to be within five years, $5 million. So now you might be wondering, what are we asking for? Well, we're asking for $5,000, for $50,000. 
Within the first four months, we're going to be using $40,000 to build our app and to create the two main functionalities, the categorizing posts and auto planning. Next, we're going to use that $10,000 to advertise and get users on our platform. Finally, do we have any investors? No, but we do have interest and we're looking to add investors to our team. A huge asset of this project, well, is the team. I, Basmala, oversee the financials, and Mauro oversees the marketing and social aspect of the app, and finally, my partner, Maureen, oversees the tech aspect. Thank you very much. So let us set the plan. So, so you, you do, do it. it. <laughs> Um, I have two questions. I'll start with the first one, which is, I, it wasn't clear to me what features are available for the sort of premium versus the free. What's the okay. differentiators there? Okay, so uh, when it comes to the freemium, it's only based locally. So in, you're, let's say you're an NYC <laughs> resident. You'll only be able to use the app in NYC. And once you travel, you will be able to use, a, a, to use the upgraded version if you switch to premium. And also, we're deciding to put a quota on the number of friends you can have and also the place, uh, like, the, uh, the um, uh, plans you can have, just because you know the premium might be seasonal if we only limit it to traveling. Makes sense. Uh, and the second question is, the back end of building this, uh, familiar with these types of products, the big one of the big challenges is really aggregating data from various sources, right? Restaurants, <laughs> when events are happening, all those sort of things. And some of those are very clear. Restaurant data you can get, although you often have to pay for a good feed. Um, but event data is not very aggregated across things. How are you guys going to sort of source the information you use for the product? Um, you like yeah, I was going to say our um, main goal is to take social media um, saved posts that are already there from like my Instagram that I already have so many places, restaurants, events, and the app will plan according to these saved posts and then recommend stuff. So that's not like we're really going looking for events. It's based on the user's interest and saved posts. So to add on to that, the way we're going to get those posts, for example, from Instagram is using the Instagram API or using stuff like the TikTok API and as well as any kind of third-party web scraper um, the applications that we can use. So instead of really uh, building our own applications, we're looking to use third-party applications, at least for our beginning stages, to really reduce our cost of you know, building an application. You, you guys are asking $50,000. Yes. It doesn't seem like a lot, especially in terms of building all the back end and yeah. tech. How, how do you arrive at that? Well, number? since an, it's an MVP, we're going to focus on uh, functionalities like you can hang out with your friends, like the calendar, and also the um, the social media where it can link and organize the the saved post to auto plan. So uh, it is too little for the MVP, but as we expand, that's the going to be the money what, that we're going to need for internationally to figure out how we can figure out to give the user a preview of their full plan when they're traveling. And to add on to that, we chose uh, $50,000 because uh, based on apps similar to us, the, the cost to create an app like this cost around $30,000 to all the way up to like Instagram, which costed $200,000. And because this is an MVP product with just the two main basic functionalities, we believe that this is an accurate and reasonable price to ask for, especially within the first four months. Hey, Ryan, I'm, I'm curious as what your thoughts are to this since uh, you're very big into the, the marketing space. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, launching a social network is, is difficult because you need to uh, have enough people on the network for it to be, uh, you know, ex an exciting place to be. So I think that starting with the CUNY students is a great idea, and I would love to see a more built out go-to-market plan around how you intend to actually, you know, get folks at CUNY to start using the app. So the way to address that, if that was a question, is I'm part of a club at Queens College, it's called Girls Who Code, and a lot of times our club started virtually, and now we're looking to really host meetups in person, and there's, you know, so many different applications that we have to use from Discord to GroupMe to so-and-so to just, like, join in, and there's a lot of, like, planning issues that most people don't talk about, which is, like, so when do people have to leave, you know, what are their dietary preferences, um, if there's any other, like, social expectations that they want people to follow or that they need other people to know about. So in our app, we're going to be able to address all of those issues, and we're really also just trying to reach out to, like, other, like, school clubs and just, like, groups of people who want to hang out and make sure people don't, like, you know, <laughs> just be able to, like, have fun and go out. And also, just to add on, we want to build a community where yeah. people can actually meet people with the same interests and have friends, especially that CUNY schools are kind of commuter schools. We want to address the problem of friend making through this app. 
Philip? And I noticed that you guys have uh, 10,000 allocated to like influencers and marketing. How long do you think that 10,000 will last you and if you'll need more? So since we're our target, uh, we're going to start with CUNY students, we're going to heavily focus on word of mouth, which is college events. So if it's like college fairs or like sport games or anything like that, that's where the 10,000 to print out flyers or anything like that. And like just to speak to um, students and a great app like this will launch really quickly, especially for us as consumers ourselves, it's, so, it's yeah. a struggle to plan an outing just to figure out what to do next or like a restaurant to do. Like I want sushi, but she just wants something else. It's like a struggle. So the planning an app like this that plans for us according to what everybody likes is would be a huge asset. All right, thank you. Uh, good job. Sheets from each of you when you're ready. Just give us a minute. We're just going to be doing a little uh, finalizing of uh, tabulation of scores. I'll set the next team up, which is going to be Prometheus Investors. Check out the competition. <laughs> <laughs> How's the live stream been going, uh, Adia? It's good. It's good, stuff. Yeah. Oh, good. See, it's working so far. <laughs> Earlier, when I first came in here, that monitor was going off. So I went to the back of it to see what's going on with that particular monitor. And of course, the cables are all cramped and has this device. So it connects those two. So I had to unplug everything. We plug it in. But then I had to tell everybody, hey, by the way, it may just go dark on you, in which case, you know, adjust and adapt. So I think the, so far, so good. The Twitch link on the Eventbrite is broken. Ah, the Twitch link on the Eventbrite? <laughs> Mohammed can take care of that. You can stay here with this, right? No, no, it has to no, be. No, you have to do it. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for that. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Jonathan Colon, and today I'll be pitching my team startup, Prometheus Investors. So what Prometheus Investors is, is we are a two-sided platform. We are an educational resource for finance students who are underrepresented, and we are a recruitment platform for financial institutions. So what we provide in terms of students, we provide uh, basically educational classes where students learn to invest, and learn to manage and allocate stock in a portfolio. So when they've learned that, they actually apply what they've learned in real time to an investment platform. The results are then made available for financial institutions, and financial institutions can actively recruit using those real world results. So currently, we are in the fintech industry. The fintech industry is in a $166 billion industry and has grown on average by 14.6% year over year between 2017 and 2022. So the problem we're trying to address, currently financial institutions mainly recruit from elite colleges 
And that means qualified students from non-elite colleges uh, basically miss out on opportunities. So 75% of underrepresented students are not hired for competitive roles in finance because of that, even though they may be qualified. Um, so our solution is to develop a platform where these underrepresented students can learn how to invest, learn how to manage assets, and actually develop real world tr uh, results for these financial institutions to actively recruit. So it's not just applications, they're actually getting to see what these students do, how they invest, and what they're capable of. So currently, um, we're making this free to students, so our addressable market size, our overall market size is 44,000 globally in terms of financial institutions. Uh, there are 18,000 financial institutions in the United States. Realistically, we want to acquire 15 memberships or 15 financial institutions in our first year because we feel that's realistic as a startup. So what do we do that our competitors, such as Indeed, Monster, uh, LinkedIn, Glassdoor, uh, what do we do that they don't? We provide unlimited free job postings, which most organizations, they sometimes they charge on a per clerk, clerk basis. We provide job advocacy and uh, lower recruitment costs overall to these financial institutions. Uh, traction. Currently we are in the research phase, but we plan on having a beta out by March 2023. Um, and we're also working on customer surveys, uh, videos. We have a mock-up, a website, and we trademarked so far, as well as acquired indications of interest. Moving on. So what we'll be charging financial institutions is $10,000 um, our costs would be basically 10%, which is commission for the student ambassadors who are able to acquire financial institutions, plus $350 per expense, leaving $8,650 in gross profit. Awareness. Um, we are planning on bringing awareness through clubs, um, colleges, word of mouth, guerrilla marketing, and uh, student ambassadors. And we actually already have clubs that are committed to, to working in Duma Beta. Projections. Our revenue growth, we are projecting 30% year over year. We feel that's realistic for a new company. Um, and an average customer growth of 25%, which if you look at maybe 15 financial institutions, that's not really much of a big target. So that, that's realistic as well. The ask. What we're asking for is $50,000 to develop a beta platform for the first stage and $6,000 for the instructor fees. Um, so. Now the team. My name is Jonathan Colon. I'm CEO and an undergraduate finance major, minoring in economics at Brooklyn College. I'm Marlon Bailey. I'm a master's in urban studies student. I'm, a, I'm the chief diversity officer. My name is Maxim Boyko. I'm the chief uh, research officer, and I'm an undergraduate student here at Baruch. Uh, I'm Zoe Zhao. I'm an exercise major doing desire and actuary. And together we are Prometheus Investors. So at this point, we'll be opening up the floor for any questions that the uh, panelists may have. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, Philip, can you go in a little bit more detail uh, how you uh, acquire people to uh, get students to the platform? Yeah, so we already have some indications of interest from clubs. So I'm actively working with a variety of different clubs, and we have clubs like very actually very excited about it. Um, we've done something similar where we were able to um, acquire basically funding from a hedge fund CEO to do a competition with educational resources, and it was an investment competition. So we've done something similar before, and we were able to, to acquire uh, students from uh, at least Brooklyn College. We look forward to maybe doing a beta model with uh, Baruch as well. I'm curious, you position yourself, your competitors, as job search companies, organizations. I see you as something different. There's a large educational component here, which I guess there's competition there, but you guys not focused that way? Um, I think we're focused more on the recruitment aspect, since that's who we're going to be charging the, the money to, is basically financial institutions. So we emphasize that, I think, over the educational aspect. One of the things I feel like you're missing from, from the pitch is, uh, you know, uh, as somebody who, who hires a lot, it's really important to have a diverse team. And I think you could lead with, like, uh, a little more front with that, you know, like, help diversify your, your hiring through a, a platform like this, because if you're just going to Yale or what have you, you know, getting a less diverse workforce. Yeah, 
course. Yeah, I agree to add kind of another side to that is you describe the problem very much from the student perspective and less so from the company's perspective. And it's the company that you're ultimately charging with the business model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was a little bit of what I was going to ask is, uh, obviously, I think the intention here is to provide the opportunity for students to invest and demonstrate their ability to invest. But are you guys going to be building out the rest of the profiles of those students for recruiters who are looking? And I don't remember what the exact number is, but in financial services, I think it's only like 2% of jobs are actually investing jobs. 98% do something different entirely. They're not stock picking, they're not bond picking, they're doing something else. So there's a lot of opportunity out there and a lot of what's being captured at elite schools. I'm a Baruch alumni, so. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, is not necessarily trading jobs per se. How are you guys addressing those other aspects of this problem? In terms of the investment aspect? or like In terms of understanding more about a student or an applicant or a candidate than just their investment expertise, as well as their ability to fit into roles that aren't investing roles. Uh, you don't mind me interjecting? Um, you like yeah, um, we do a profile and a test kitchen, so that will address each criteria of each student. So we'll gather a profile from that, and as we go along, we'll build more on the program. So we'll have a more diverse um, um, amount of students to represent our platform, and also for companies to hire. So what we'll also be doing is uh, informational interviews with hiring managers to see what they look for in qualified candidates and basically create metrics based on that, as well as just develop student profiles and make those metrics available to them. So Brian, you, yeah, I was just going to say, you're at recruited.com. Right? Yeah, we can, we can talk a lot, because this is very similar to the work that I was doing with Uncute before, um, so we can talk after. But a question I have here is, are you gating it to certain schools? Because if you're mentioning that these companies tend to go for students who are going to elite universities, and this platform takes off and students are getting jobs through it, then I could see students from elite universities going onto the platform. And so if there's this inherent bias with the employer, if they're looking at the school and similar results and they lean a certain way because of the school brand, how do you, I guess, Chief Diversity Officer, how do you plan to, uh, I guess, combat that bias from moving to the digital space versus the in-person? Well, we are, as I said, you got to use a test kitchen, we got to, come up with the companies and their profile and, and see what they need. Mm -hmm. So without analyzing the data, we'll come up with a, the correct solution. So right now, I can get back to you with the answer to that. Okay. But we have a workout all the, the other parts of the King's okay. So you know, it's early. We had X amount of weeks to deal with this situation. So um, you have the card, and you can get back. I'll have an answer for you. Okay. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, so, what would what would be the advantage for a financial institution to use your platform um, if they're already recruiting from elite schools, and then they're going to use a platform like yours where they pay an extra fee on top to recruit from from other schools? What would be the advantage for them? More inexpensive. Um, you also have um, basically access to a wider or more diverse background of students. So, diversity inclusivity is a big thing. People are looking to actually acquire, you know. Uh, talent from other schools, they just don't have a real, like, keen or, or static way of doing that. They have basically initiatives and programs. What we're offering them is uh, kind of like a disruptor. We're offering them not just, um, you know, not just a student or an applicant. We're also offering them real-world results based on that, so they have something more to go on. Okay. Thank you. 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 Hi everyone, my name is Tisnuba and I'm here with my partner Sam and Lisa. Over the past three months we've been working on UniHealth which is a service that helps increase accessibility to culturally sensitive mental health resources. The global mental health market is expected to grow to over $538 billion, growing at an 18% growth rate in the next eight years. We want to tap into that market and address the needs of a specific underrepresented group, um, college students with an immigrant background. 
I came to the United States five years ago. As an immigrant student, I couldn't fit into the United States culture because there was two cultures to fit in. So I need a mental health professional who can truly understand me and has the same experience, for example, in language barrier. So I feel like there's around 100,000 students with cultural background have the same problems as me, including hardship identify a mental health issue, struggling to find experts, professionals, and they don't know where to start addressing mental health issues like depression and anxiety. As Lisa mentioned, there are thousands of students facing major mental health issues. With UniHelp, we plan to provide users with mental health experts with cultural background, informative mental health resources to address those mental health issues, mindfulness training using physical and mental exercises, as well as an online supportive community. A key component of, we have four key components to our service, inform, chat room, seek an expert, and my favorite, brain train, which will provide users with mindfulness training, um, physical exercises, as well as breathing techniques. As of now, our demographic is college students with a cultural background, and for our overall market, we want to target that demographic within New York City, so that's approximately 600,000 people. And then we, for our addressable market, we want to narrow it down to 100,000 people, specifically focusing on CUNY students with a cultural background. And for our target uh, market for the first year, we want to get 10% of that population, so we would bring in 10,000 customers. Our competition varies from university counseling resources, online platforms for finding medical professional, nonprofit organizations, and existing ther teletherapy services. We noticed that none of our competitors really have the four key components that we want to include in our service, which includes culturally sensitive experts, mindful exercises, diverse community, and informative content. We are using premium model. We provide free subscription with a limited access to our platform. To unlock this access, our users need to purchase VIP subscription. We provide 14-day premium trial. After that, it will cost $4 per month or $36 annually. Uh, we have 10,000 subscribers, our target market. Because of it, we will get a revenue total of $360,000. And we will have a direct cost of $50,000, which will lead us to gross profit of $310,000. This is our forecasted revenue for coming five years after we launch. According to this forecast, our revenue will increase 10% each year. We plan to bring our services into the mental health market by way of social media, word of mouth, geo-targeting, and other key marketing tools. After sales, we would stay engaged with our users through customer feedback and strong customer support to improve our services. We are currently at the latter end of the ideation phase, and by spring of 2023, we plan to have a functioning MVP. And thereafter, we would have potential consumers and partners. As we head into the prototyping phase, we're asking for $120,000 in funding. 75% of it will go into development of our mobile app and a website, and the rest will go into marketing to bring in customers. And lastly, I want to introduce our team. We're all CUNY students. We bring in um, a variety of skills, strengths, and experiences that help us work well together. And we're very driven and passionate about mental health, and we hope that this service comes to fruition. Thank you all for your time. We want to invite you guys to scan this QR code uh, to be a part of our beta testing and exclusive updates as well. And we're going to open up the floor to questions. What kind of regulatory challenges are there in the mental health space? Um, Can you elaborate on that? You have to get uh, accreditation. You have to. Yeah, so we're currently um, coming up with ideas on how we would bring in the mental health experts because uh, we do know that there are challenges such as insurance and different rates that they want. Um, so that's something that we are that we are still in the process of planning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question related to that because you mentioned it's three dollars a month. Four, yeah, four dollars a month, four, and then twenty five percent off a year. If you do the annuals, yeah. So at thirty six bucks but a therapist is probably going to charge 200 bucks an hour or so. Right. Where, how are you offsetting that? Mm -hmm. So we were thinking of doing it as a um, kindness of heart type of thing for the therapist. Um, so that would be something that they would put on their 
services that will provide for under um, represented students so a lot of culturally diverse students don't have the funds to pay for a therapist which is up to two hundred dollars so that's why we're asking for the funds to help um, provide those therapists with the money that they ask for are these services not provided by the, the institutions the, the universities they are but um, what we found by multiple surveys is that they are very they're not very culturally diverse it's a lot of it's one demographic and they can't understand a Muslim student, a Christian student, or different students of religion. So with our service, we plan to provide users with experts who are culturally diverse. Yeah, and that's only one part of the feature. We also have um, a, a feature called Brain Train, which has mindful exercises that are physical exercises or breathing exercises. So you can't really, when you need help in the moment, you can't really go to someone um, and immediately get help. So this would help you regulate yourself. If at 3 a.m. you're looking for somebody to talk to, we also have a chat room that you could talk in there. We'll have a, we're, we're, we have an idea of having an AI bot that would assist you right on the spot if nobody's up or if nobody's texting. What do you do if the, if this goodness of heart you're looking for doesn't exist, or is not there's not enough of it? How, how do you how do you proceed? So we would work on a plan to. Um, link the insurance companies to our service and we would get since we're providing the students to the experts we would get a portion of that and then it would be a one-time trial so they would the user would go to the expert and then after that is their discretion if they want to stay with that expert or continue to use our app you understand let me ask you a different question suppose your social the social piece the chat piece becomes more important than the rest that might be enough of a solution. I'm not suggesting it is, but would you go, would you pursue that, or are you going to stick to your original plan? We have to have the, the providers as well. Mm -hmm. So we believe our ability to pivot is monumental, and we've been doing that throughout the course of the semester. So if the market calls for more for more of a chat room aspect, then we'll gauge our interest to creating a marketing, creating a chat room that is accessible, more accessible, and has a higher, um, access, yeah, accessibility rate. You, you mentioned, the, obviously, the focus of this is cultural diversity. Um, but the way that you've kind of framed it is culturally diverse audience, culturally diverse therapists. Or, um, but you didn't mention if they're the same background. So how do you ensure that if that's the issue that's driving? Yeah, this. about the same background. For example, I speak Russian, right? Mm -hmm. I need someone therapist who speaks Russian. Mm -hmm. So our service will provide those needs for each individual, for the language barrier, also the cultural background. For example, like Samuel said, religion will also provide because there's, especially in New York City, there are a lot of people who has came from different countries, right? So we can find those people, those therapists for our students. Additionally, both sides would um, go through a survey process to kind of match them up with the best um, therapist possible. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So now we're going to go to our AI in the back room. <laughs> hey, Gary, you have any tunes for the audience? <laughs> All right. Gary's out. Uh, does it all. <laughs> but we actually have a, um, what's the name of that uh, artist? Cole Campbell. Cole? Campbell. Cole Campbell. Uh, he's this uh, hip hop artist, just really phenomenal. He did this uh, song, uh, Seize the Moment, that, uh, that people really liked a lot. And, and, and we thought, wow, that's, you know, that's really what we're trying to do as students, seize the moment. You know, so we're going to go with that. And as far as the uh, team that gets the bonus, do we just put it on this? Yeah, you can put board? it on this thing. Okay. So the just team that gets the, the bonus, bottom. just put it in the front. Okay. There, just it. put the, the bonus points there. Oh, got it. And then. Uh... Okay, you're done? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. Awesome. 
There we go. Seize the moment. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you. So, uh, uh, first, uh, thank you for everybody for participating for the 10 weeks. Uh, you students uh, in the middle of doing everything that you guys are doing, it's tremendous. So, just uh, yeah. it's a lot of work that you're doing a lot of time to do. And, judges, thank you once again for taking the time. Um, so it was really close. I mean, so I'm just, I'll be, <laughs> it was really close, like a point, you know, uh, and I say, always tell everybody at any competition, these are six human beings. I put another six human beings, they come up with different scores. So just take that into consideration, because I did, do believe you all did a really, really good job. Okay? So in third place is UniHealth. UniHealth. Congratulations. Thank you. That's awesome. Congrats. Congrats. All right. In second place is Prometheus. Woo. Come on down. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Way to go, Molly. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to have to make room for the first place. Yeah. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> first place is Easy Meats. Good <laughs> clap for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're going to want to take some photos of judges. So first the judges, and then we want to take photos of the third, second, and first place winners. Okay, mm -hmm. so why don't we start with the judges first? Okay, why don't we get them? Where would be a good spot? Over, over there in the corner. Good job, guys. Good job. Good job. Good job. Congrats. Congrats. Yeah. Okay, I'm telling you, I was there going with it. I'm like, Alright, who was the third place? Uni out. Yeah, can you guys go over there and then Mohammed will take a picture of you guys? Congratulations. Oh, thank you, Rami. Thank you for It was really well you the the, the, the first place was, was clear. That that one clearly won, but second, third, fourth, and fifth was just a point difference. Literally a one point at the it's just I, and that always happens. And just for whatever reason that just always takes place. And what I do with all the scores, I have all the scores normalized for judge. Because some judges score seven to seven, but some judges score seven to ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I've learned over time to normalize the scores. Well, that's why that first round took me so long, was because I went through, and then after I had a few of the bar was set, and then I Okay, uh, the, the second place team, Prometheus. We're not going to make it a... Which is we making this? 